equity member on the International Archival Section, Affairs Section, Society of American Archivists, and I'm going to be moderating today's presentation. Just a little housekeeping, I would like to request that you write any questions that you have for our speaker in the chat box, and please mute your, your microphones and put your cameras on invisible because that will help with the bandwidth for today's presentation. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to Archival Landscapes. This is a virtual seminar series presented by the International Archival Affairs Section of the Society of American Archivists. In each of these seminars, an international guest speaker introduces participants to the issues and adva advancements in their local context, describing the history, operating environment, and unique aspects of archival practice in their country. The seminar series is hosted by the Graduate School of Library and Information Studies, Queens College, City University of New York. Today's seminar looks at Ireland and will be presented by Dr. Elizabeth Mullins. Elizabeth Mullins is the Director of the Master in Arts in Archives and Records Management at the University College Dublin, Ireland. She holds a BA in History and German and a PhD in Medieval History. Following an Irish Research Council postdoctoral award, she completed a higher diploma in archival studies in University College Dublin. She spent a year working in the Irish Jesuit archives before joining the staff of the School of History in 2005. Since this time, she has worked with colleagues to introduce a range of archives and records management and program certificates, masters, and doctoral programs. Her research interests include archival traditions in Ireland, the archiving of faith traditions, and archival description and medieval manuscript culture. She continues to work as an archival consultant, particularly in the field of religious archives. Welcome, Elizabeth. So great, and um, thank you very much, um, Kate, and uh, for your introduction, and a uh, special thanks also to James Lowry, who extended to me the invitation to speak about Ireland as part of this uh, series of talks on archival landscapes. I'm just going to share my um, screen with you there, Jane, James, if I can. Okay. Right. Um, okay, so since, since James invited me to do this talk a couple of months ago, I found myself thinking a fair bit about the potential meanings of the word landscape as it is applied to archives. Um, the National Geographic defines a landscape as part of the Earth's surface that can be viewed at one time from one place. The word itself comes from the Dutch word landschap, which is the name given to paintings of a countryside. In addition to this definition, however, National Geographic also draws attention to the idea of a cultural landscape, citing the work of UNESCO's World Heritage Committee. And they identify three kinds of cultural landscapes. The first is a clearly defined landscape designed and created intentionally by man. The second type of cultural landscape, as you can see on the slide, is an organically evolved landscape, which is one where the spiritual, economic, and cultural significance of an area developed alongside its physical characteristics. The last type of cultural landscape, according to UNESCO, is an associative one. And this is one much like an organically evolved landscape, except the physical evidence of historical human use of the site may be missing. Its significance is an association with the spiritual, economic, or cultural feature of a people. Thinking about these, um, sorry, I just want to go on. Yeah. Thinking about these definitions as applied to the concept of archives, the idea of an archival landscape it seems to me, is to do firstly with the physical environment where records are kept, the ways that records and their repositories impact, um, impact on the geography of the country and indeed how the geography of the country and its history impacts on its records. Thinking about the idea of the etymology of the word, however, in terms of painting, it is clear that the archival landscape of Ireland that I present to you today 
is my representation grounded in my place and time. So Kate uh, described, for example, at the start of the talk, my, my, my own biography, and indeed the, the painting that I had at the, on the title slide is from where I go on my holidays, a uh, place called Ackle Island in our, off the coast of the west of Ireland. How a landscape is presented is in a sense all about the stance and perspective of the viewer. In addition to the geographic dimension, the concept of the cultural landscape of archives in Ireland engages much more with the landscape of the mind. There is the idea of intentionality. So what role are archives intended to play? How is this reflected, for example, in the legis legislative environment, which sets borders and boundaries around the acquisition and access to records? And connected to this are the other more organically evolved features of the archival landscape in Ireland, to the ways that those most concerned with archives, be they creators, archivists and users, perceive records and manage them. What spiritual, culture, cultural and indeed political values have been and are connected with records. And finally, thinking about the third aspect of UNESCO's cultural uh, landscapes definition, to what extent can the cultural landscape of archives in Ireland be understood as an associative one? Is there a connection not to the actual records which do exist, but to imagined records which may tell more fully the story of the country and its individual citizens? Many of these understandings of archival landscape are implicit in perhaps the most well-known use of the term in the title to the 2011 American Archivist article by Terry Cook, the archive is a foreign country, historians, archivists, and the changing archival landscape. It is worth noting, however, that while Cook uses the term and the title to his article, it appears only once towards the end of the introductory paragraph, and it is not expanded upon. A more recent, very interesting interrogation of the nature of the contemporary archival landscape is found in the special edition of the journal Lit, Literature Interpretation Theory, entitled Literature in the New Archival Landscape. And in their editorial, Jadwick and Vermolen highlight the digital and ecological dimensions of the contemporary archive. Using the example of a basic Google search, they note that the archive not only stores the present, even as it unfolds, it also actively produces the present and the future. In this sense, they say that the archive is an interface or an apparatus, a site of processing, rather than preservation. Having thus thought about what the idea of the archival landscape might involve, the next issue to address in this talk is to think about what I mean when I talk about Ireland. The complex history of the island over the past 100 years since the partition of the country into two parts, so the six counties of Northern Ireland, which remained part of the United Kingdom and the 26 counties of the South of Ireland, now the, Ar the Republic of Ireland, create an interesting archival landscape in all senses of the world. word. In my talk today, I will try to present some aspects of the archival landscape as it, as it applies to the whole island of Ireland. Uh, and I will mainly focus on the history of the management of archives on the island over the past 100 years. But I would like from the outset to acknowledge that I am someone who was born and has lived only in the south of Ireland. I will thus speak to a certain extent about the north when I can, but my talk mainly focuses on the 26 counties south of the border. Um, and I just wanted to refer people to, to Anne's work, Anne Gilliland's work about the six counties. Um, so Anne is doing wonderful work at the moment about the history of the border between uh, the north and the south of Ireland. Uh, and also you can see a reference there to an article, a chapter in a book from 2015. The division of Ireland into two political entities in 1921 had a profound impact on the archival landscape of the, of the island. Immediately after partition, plans were put in place for the establishment of a second national archive on the island located in Belfast in the north and holding the records of the six counties of Ulster to appear. The Public Record Office of Ireland, which was first established in 1867 to hold the records of 800 years of British rule in the island, would continue in Dublin, so down here, with responsibility for the records of the southern part of the country. 
In addition to the establishment of these two national archives, the archival history of the island was impacted massively by an event that took place in the year immediately after partition, so in 1922. By this stage, the south of Ireland had been engulfed by a civil war centered around, around those who supported the treaty that had resulted in the partition of the country and those who opposed it. In April 1922, the Public Record, of, Public Record Office of Ireland in Dublin was occupied by anti-treaty forces. The occupation continued until the 30th of June 1922, when an explosion in the building resulted in the devastating destruction of many of its records. And you can see the photographs of the smoke uh, here and then the, uh, the aftermath. Ernie O'Malley, who was garrisoned as a soldier inside the four courts, later gave an account of the fire in his memoir stating how the yard was littered with chunks of masonry and smouldering records. Pieces of white paper were gyrating in the upper air like seagulls. The explosion and heat carried the fragments of charred records across the city of Dublin. While appeals were issued for the return of the fragments, this was largely unsuccessful. Herbert Wood, the deputy keeper of the public record office at the time, noted that the response was ridiculously small. It is more than likely that such records as were picked up have been kept of, of, as mementos of a remarkable occasion. It is to this man, Herbert Wood, that we owe the most comprehensive description of what the Public Record of Office of Ireland contained. His guide to the Public Record Office had been published in 1919 and listed over 5,500 series organized hierarchically by departments of state. Additionally, the Ecclesiastical and Testamentary Collection comprised the diocesan and parish records of the Church of Ireland, the oldest records in the repository with the Christchurch deeds dating back to the 13th century. Municipal and local records were also transferred to the archive, as were papers of several private individuals. What kind of response did the two archives in Belfast and Dublin make to this devastating loss? The Public Record Office of Northern Ireland was led at the time by David Chart, charismatic archivist who had worked in the Public Record Office in Dublin before transferring, before the 1921 partition to Belfast, to remain and work as part of the British Civil Service in Northern Ireland. In the wake of the destruction of the Four Courts, Chart presented a vision of the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland, which involved collecting material to, you can see, fill the gaps in Ulster history. He wrote, the documents could convey a strong sense of Ulster history, which the new government desired to promote and continued. The ancient province of Ulster has, has consistently been at the forefront of events. Its legends are richer, more detailed, and generally speaking, earlier in date than the rest of Ireland. By 1923, the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland Act had been passed and Chart liaised with and received support from both the British government in Westminster and staff in the Public Record Office in Chancery Lane in London, most notably S.A. Ratcliffe. And I've put a reference here to Eliza McKee's wonderful article about, the, about this development and the remarkable work undertaken by staff at Prony to gather records from all kinds of public and private sources in the period after 1922, to sort of construct and, and reconstruct this history of Ulster. A much more complex set of circumstances existed south of the border, where the Public Record Office of Ireland was now answerable to the government of what was then called the Irish Free State. While this government resisted any efforts by Chart and his contemporaries, to move the records linked to the history of Ulster that had survived in Dublin, north of the border, they did not invest in building up the National Archive in the southern part of the country. And it is fair to say that neglect was probably the main characteristic of the archival landscape of the south of Ireland for the first 50 years of its history. The work of the skeleton staff in the Public Record Office of Ireland was consistently underfunded, and despite lobbying, records in the south of the country were still governed by the 1867 Public Record Act. The effort to try to replace the loss of material linked to the Four Courts fire in the south was largely led by a body known as the Irish Manuscripts Commission, 
the establishment of which had been first advocated for by W. B. Yeats, the poet, in his role as a senator in the new Irish Free State. When the Senate Committee on Irish Manuscripts issued its final report in June 1924, Yeats introduced it by saying, for the first time in many centuries, our country, free and, in and independent, is charged with the pious duty of preserving and making accessible to Irishmen the mass of learning and tradition, which forms the basis of our national history. The IMC initially focused its efforts on a program of publication and worked closely with other bodies, such as the Public Record Office of Ireland, the Royal Irish Academy and the National Library of Ireland. However, the IMC's work was stymied by a lack of government funding. Its advocacy for increased management of the records of the new state was met with a lack of understanding of the evidential role of current records. Political concerns also played a role, in particular in relation to how increasing access to records in the south of Ireland from whatever time period could call into question the narrative of oppression, which informed so much of the new identity of the south of the country. In addition to the work of the Manuscripts Commission, one genuinely exceptional archival development of this period was investment in the collecting of folklore. This took place under the auspices of the Irish Folklore Commission, first established in the 1930s. Its paid collectors traveled around Ireland recording stories, often in the Irish language, a language that had been largely absent from the administrative colonial archive that had been held in the four courts. And you can see here on the slide an example of the um, of one of the collector's work. This is from uh, 1938 uh, and it's uh, from County Donegal in, in Irish. The work of these folklore collectors was supplemented by an early remarkable example of crowdsourcing, which namely the school's folklore collection. Dating from 1930, 1937 to 1939, primary school children, so between around the ages of nine and 12, recorded in excess of 750,000 pages of local history and oral tradition from across the 26 counties of the Irish Free State. So you can see an example on the slide. This is um, one of these children's copy books about local cures. And, and there's some uh, pressed dried leaves from the plants that are being talked about here. And then there's the cure for things like ivy uh, and parsley included. Um, one of the big things was how neat people could get their handwriting, I think. Um, the archival landscape in the South began to change only really from 1970 onwards when a number of circumstances led to a core group of individuals forming a pressure group known as the Irish Society for Archives. The ISA demanded change in terms of increased access for historians to the records of government after 1922. The transfer of government record and a kind of hand in hand with this, I guess, the transfer of government records from departments to the archive, the development of archival training, support for the acquisition by repositories of personal and business papers, and for the preservation of archives at local level. At the forefront of this change was a man called Robin Dudley Edwards, who was then the professor of modern Irish history in UCD, the university that I work at. Dudley Edwards was a larger than life figure whose appreciation of the value of scientific history and the archives as the evidence for this history had been honed by his time as a doctoral student under the tutelage of Sir Hilary Jenkinson in University College London. While this may have given a direct link uh, ostensibly between the development of archives in the south of England, south of Ireland and the English tradition, it was in fact to Europe that the first Irish archivists were sent for training and in particular to the Bundesarchiv in Koblenz, West Germany itself an archive which had been founded in the aftermath of partition and war. Um, so I just uh, put this picture in to show you a man called Friedrich Kallenberg, who's very important, a little bit of uh, archival trivia. I, this, was, this is Sieg Siegfried Butner, who anyone who's had to teach a course about appraisal, I have never seen a photograph of him <laughs> before I came across this yesterday. Um, anyway, to go back to my, my talk. So this man, Friedrich Kallenberg, um, who was then a senior archivist, was after the archivists had been sent to train there, the training archivists, 
He was invited to archive to Ireland in the spring of 1971 to review the state of Irish archives and his lectures formed the basis of the contents for the first Irish archives bulletin, now the journal of the Irish Society for Archives. In this archives bulletin, dating from May 1971, you can see that Kallenberg noted that the foreign archivist visiting Ireland is impressed by the gap between the richness of historical and above all archival material the Irish people can be so proud of and the inadequate care of the government for the preservation and utilization of the nation's memory, which lies in its archives. Burke's comments on the piteous state of Irish archives were little appreciated by government circles in Ireland at the time, but the, but the momentum for the development of archives in the country was underway. Despite the lack of investment in the half century before 1970, it is interesting to note how Ireland was in sync with many countries in terms of things that happened at this time, such as, for example, the establishment of professional training course at UCD, which would be led single-handedly by my former colleague, Ailsa Holland, for the next 30 years. The 1970s also saw the establishment of the Irish Region of the Society of Archivists, uh, which is our professional body, which up to then had only uh, applied to the, to the UK. The fact that the Professional Association for Archivists in Ireland encompassed the whole island from its inception was indicative of the support which had been given to Southern Irish archivists from those in Belfast for many years, and also indicative of the need to sustain professional links at a time of increased political violence in the North. While progress was painfully slow, the 1980s finally witnessed the establishment of a National Archives of Ireland to replace the old Public Record Office and State Paper Office and also saw the passing of the National Archives Act in 1986. So this remarkably, the first piece of standalone archival legislation for the South of Ireland, replacing the 1867 Act. The 1986 Act itself was shepherded through the Irish Parliament by Gareth Fitzgerald, this man, who was the Taoiseach at the time, so our Prime Minister, who had himself been a student of Robin Dudley Edwards at UCD. The development of archives at both local level and in the country's universities also started to gain momentum from the 1970s onwards. The first county archive was established in Cork in 1971, an entirely characteristic move for the rebellious second city in the south of Ireland. I, I'm from Cork, so I couldn't leave this go without, um, <laughs> without flying its flag. Um, but I did also want to show you uh, on the slide where the archive, the Cork archive, has been, was located. So initially it was in the basement of the city's courthouse. It then moved and was for quite a long time in uh, a church. Uh, it, and then uh, finally in 2006 it, in a standalone archive building. Um, I, it, this kind of transition always makes me think about Eric Catalar's work on the architecture of archive buildings, archival temples and archival prisons, and lots of um, county archives in Ireland actually have this kind of transition between a jail uh, or, uh, or a church. Other local authority archives were established in this period. Um, the first eight years after Cork, uh, with the remit, remit for collecting papers, both public and private, private at local level. So you can see all the counties in Ireland here. Again, this development has continued to be patchy, and even with the passing of a second piece of legislation in the form of uh, in relation to archives as part of a local government act in 1994, archives at local level continued often to be looked after in local studies libraries, with little input from professionally trained individuals. The role of university archives as a repository for private papers was also augmented since the 1970s. So while Trinity uh, College had always had a manuscripts department, obviously, the archives department at University College Dublin um, was only established by Dudley Edwards in the 1970s as the locus for training arch archivists, but also as a working repository requiring deposits of private papers of many of the formative politicians of the Irish Free State. The archive set up at the University of Galway, 
became the de facto archive for much of the west of the country. And I've just put on um, the slide a couple of images from these university archives. So this is from uh, the archive at UCD. You can see it's from the private papers of a man called Liam Mellows, who actually was one of the people who had been a soldier in the four courts during the civil war and the explosion, who was captured and then subsequently executed in the December of that year. Um, this, these two archives down here are from the University Archive at NUIG, uh, including a really important archive of the Irish language, the Conor and Gaeilge Archive. This is from the University of Limerick's uh, Archive and Special Collections. They're the papers of an Irish writer called Kate O'Brien. And finally, really recently, the archive, the University Archive at University College Cork received the donation of Richard Harris, the actor's archive. Um, other more specialist archives also began to be developed in Ireland, in the south of Ireland in the period from the 1970s. You can see here the film archive, the architectural archive, Irish traditional music archive, and of course the archive of indigenous Irish companies such as Guinness. You can see here the, uh, an ad from the 1930s with the oysters crying at the thought of it being nearly at Guinness time. One aspect of the development of the archival landscape in the south of Ireland at this time, which sets it apart from many other countries, is the quantity of the country's history, which is recorded in the private archives of the Roman Catholic Church. While the turbulent history of the Catholic Church during the period of British occupation, so the 800 years, had left gaps in the archives, in, in many religious archives, a remarkable amount of material had survived. So I'm just showing you here some images of surviving medieval and early modern material that is held as part of a, France, a collection of Franciscan material now uh, deposited in UCD. So you can see here, we, there's a, an a early 12th century Psalter, a book of the Psalms in Latin, there's an early modern diary uh, in Irish and a collection of private papers by Eamon de Valera, a 20th century uh, private collection. The, the material held in religious archives is again quite different to that preserved in the four courts in terms of its nature, so it's often spiritual or cultural in value and also the language is also quite different. The volume of records that survived from a religious context increased hugely from the 19th century onwards, a period which saw the growth in the Catholic Church in the country. And the foundation of many new orders, and indeed the coming into Ireland of European Catholic congregations at this stage, also introduced different archival and record keeping traditions into the country. So I'm just showing you here um, an image from a really remarkable archive that I worked in as a consultant last year. Um, so this is from a, a French Catholic order, the De La Salle brothers, who were mainly involved in education. Um, and what happened when they were founded in the 19th century was that they would send blank records over to be filled in, essentially, to record the history of, of their community. So this is just the, the top of a register, which is for a tiny uh, village in the south of Ireland called Ramsgrange. But you can see here's Ramsgrange written in, and then all the all the um, columns of the record are in French, and the names of the the people, the Irish uh, men who became teachers in uh, De La Salle teachers in this the school in this village are recorded. Um, so it's a fascinating example as the way of the way the form of the record that's sent in is sort of changing and influencing an archival tradition. The collections of religious archives from the 19th century were hugely augmented by the powerful role that was given to the Catholic Church in the Irish state after 1922. So the Catholic Church had almost complete dominance in the running of schools, in healthcare, and in the operation of a range of institutions for the most vulnerable women and children in the new state. These institutions, industrial schools for children from the poorest backgrounds, Magdalene laundries for women seem to be of questionable moral character, and mother and baby homes for unmarried mothers and their children formed what, it, formed what is now called Ireland's architecture of containment, and the last of these institutions only closed remarkably in 1996. While the archival consequences of the unravelling of the experiences of trauma in these institutions is something I will talk about in the next part of this paper, 
It is worth noting that from the 1970s onwards, archivists from Catholic religious congregations in particular had a strong awareness of the value of the records in their care and the need to get professional education and training. The first list of individual members who joined the Irish Society for Archives includes a range of academics, librarians and archivists, but also a significant number from religious backgrounds, both male and female. One of, the one of the most notable things about the development of archives in Ireland in the 50 years since the 1970s is in fact, the number of archives that were established to care for the records of religious congregations. And their growth can be tracked clearly through a series of directories of Irish archives, which were published between 1988 and 2011. By the time you get to the second edition of this directory in 1993, there's been a 40% increase in the number of entries for religious archives from, from 1988, the previous uh, version of the directory. And by this stage, religious archives account for a total of 75 of the number of archives in, which are included in the directory, making them by far the largest single category of archival institution in the country. An association of religious archivists had been founded in 1980, and this changed its name to be more inclusive of all religions and of people from all faith backgrounds by, early by the early 90s, renaming itself the Association for Church Archivists in Ireland. Again, as with both the Irish region of the Society for Archivists and the Irish Society for Archives, the Association for Church Archivists is an all island body, reflecting both the desire for inclusion in the wake of the troubles in the North, but also the reality that despite the political division, the religious organizations often operated on an all island basis. What then is the archival landscape of contemporary Ireland a hundred years after the destruction of the country's archive at the Four Courts? Going back to the discussion at the beginning of my paper, the most profound change that has happened in Ireland, as everywhere, I guess, in the more recent past, is linked to digital transformation. As in other countries, this has come hand in hand with the sense of the opening up of the ability of individuals and groups to create their own archives. The Irish Community Archive Network was established in 2008, and I'm just showing you here an example of the community archive of one of its members, which is an, ar which is an archive of, the, of an island called Scattery Island, which is off the coast of County Clare, so over kind of on the southwestern seaboard. Um, and this community archive actually pulls in, for example, the records of the schools collection that were that I talked about earlier, along with a range of other kinds of sources which create the archival landscape of this one small island. So you can see that there is a newspaper clippings and there's also an aerial photograph that somebody uploaded in 2020 of, of the island. And the sense of the kind of archival landscape of this island community extends right back to the founding of a monastery of the island in the 6th century. Many records from both communities and other archives without in independent digital preservation resources are acquired by the Digital Repository of Ireland, a government funded repository based in the Royal Irish Academy. And I'm just showing you here a page um, which uh, a slide which has just got kind of an indication of the kinds of people who have deposited digital records in the DRI. So you can see it's a really varied mixture of archives going from the Irish Postal Museum to a project around the archiving of reproductive health in Ireland, some religious archives, a school archive and uh, an oral history project, which is uh, linked to the border. It is fair to say, um, sorry, and then um, digital tools have also been used at local level uh, so that county archive structure, most imaginative, imaginatively in the case of County Offaly, right in the middle of the country, where a virtual repository now brings together records from a range of public and, and private archives, largely due to the work of Lisa Shortall, now a colleague of mine at UCD. It is fair to say that the, that the digital transformation has both hugely benefited the archival profession, but has also exposed the the reality of the chronic underfunding of government archives and local archives co that continued for most of the end of the 20th century and into the current millennium. 
The nature of this lack of resourcing in archives is writ large in the talk which Neve MacDonald, a member of the National Archives staff, gave last summer in the context of an online webinar about state archives, which placed the Irish National Archives in the context of the National Archives of Scotland, Denmark and New Zealand. Neve's talk gives a sense of the gap uh, in the acquisition of records from 1992 onwards, when the registry system broke down in government departments, the inability of the National Archives of Ireland to accession material because of space constraints, and their frustration with the 1986 National Archives Act, which firmly placed archives in a memory paradigm and gave the National Archives no role in the management of contemporary government records. Despite the obvious sense of frustration felt by many, there is also a sense of change, something which you can see clearly actually in the strategy document for the National Archives that I've put up on the slide as well. For the first time over the past number of years, government departments, semi-state bodies, and some um, of the outlying counties are appointing professional archivists. I just wanted to show you some two really recent advertisements, one for a records manager at the Department of Justice, and another for an archivist, the first archivist at um, CIE, which is our national transportation provider, which you can see um, its ad states about it having records going back to the 1830s. It's interesting to explore briefly the reasons for this change. Um, and I think there are two main reasons that have led to a sense of hope, um, and I think an increased awareness of archives and archivists in the country the first, of, the first of these, I think, in, is a result of what's called our decade of centenaries. So this decade, which has run from 1912, from, sorry, from 2012 to 2023, has remembered, the, for example, the involvement of Irish people in the First World War, our 1916 rebellion, War of Independence, the partition of the country, and now the, is commemorating our civil war. And this decade of com commemorations greatly increased government funding and archives, and this has resulted in a huge amount of material from this period being digitized and made available, and massive media exposure, both for the existence of archives and for the profession. The jewel and the crown of this endeavor has been the virtual reconstruction of the Public Record Office of Ireland, which was destroyed in 1922. This project, led by a team from Trinity College Dublin, used the 1919 catalogue from Herbert's Wood Guide, as well as surviving photographs and architectural records, to recreate virtually the appearance of the Public Record Office of Ireland. So you can see here, this is a photograph from um, the period before the explosion in 1922, and this is the virtual repository that you can go into now. The virtual repository, so the shelves in the repository, have been populated by surrogates of the destroyed records, which have been garnered from a vast range of sources, principally though from the TNA in London and the Public Record Office in Belfast. Um, so this is the kind of layout that would have been there for the original Public Record Office, and this has been used to inform now the virtual repository where you can actually virtually go in and, and take out a box and look at digital surrogates of the records. The second impetus for increased public awareness of the value of records and the role of archivists in the country, in the south of the country, has undoubtedly been the process by which the country has had to come to terms with the legacy of institutional abuse referred to earlier in the paper. Successive series of commissions of inquiry have revealed the profound suffering of individuals who were incarcerated in these institutions and the complicity of the state and religious organizations in this system. And this has drawn attention to the existence of archives of religious organizations, but has also led to huge difficulties around access to both these records and to the records of the commissions themselves. This process has led, has led to intense public discussion about, for example, the nature of evidence and the shortcomings of traditional ideas of the record. So I'm just showing you here on the slide um, a newspaper report from last year. You can see it's from September 2021. And it's about a woman who was a baby in a mother and baby home in Tune, which is a really infamous uh, mother and baby home, um, and who only discovered that she was um, had been had been a resident of the mother and baby home when she was 70, but said that she knew um, 
she knew that her fear of the dark came from her experience of being an infant in this mother and baby home. And this kind of personal testimony, I guess, has been set publicly against the textual records of this kind of home as have, as have been included in the report of the Commission to inquire into mother and baby homes. So this, for example, drew attention to the fact that there were registers, quite detailed registers, produced at the time in the mother and baby home, um, which were all which were all kind of linked to accruing money back for the for the religious organization who ran the home. It also the tech and other kinds of textual records include maps, including one here, which is where people think there may be a, a, a mass grave of infants. And there were also obviously at the time newspaper advertisements in the local newspaper in Tune for, for diocese coffins. A range of artistic expression forms part of the landscape for the discussion of these archives. There is, for example, the glass birth certificates created by an artist called Alison Lowry for babies born at the mother and baby home in Tune, for which there are no records. There have also been dramatic productions, such as a play, famous play called Laundry, produced by a new theatre company. And the recent novel by Claire Keegan, novella by Claire, Claire Keegan, Small Things Like These, which is shortlisted for the Booker Prize, is actually dedicated, is, which is, is written about a character engaging, I guess, with the existence of a mountain and laundry in a small town in County Wexford. And Keegan dedicates the work to the women and the children who suffered time in Ireland's mother and baby homes and mountain and laundries. And in the afterword of the text, you can see how she writes, how most of the records from the laundries were destroyed, lost or made inaccessible. The most recent development in this archival landscape came this year with the announcement, largely due to years of campaigning by, uh, by a range of activist groups, that a national centre for research and remembrance would be established on the grounds of the former Mountain Laundry at Sean McDermott Street in the centre of Dublin. And you can see on the slide that the centre is planned to contain a museum and exhibition space, the development of which would be led by the National Museum of Ireland, a research centre and repository of records related to institutional trauma in the 20th century, which will form part of the National Archives, and a place for reflection and re remembrance. In addition, contributing to the social and economic development of the Dublin's North Inner East Inner City, the part of the city it's in, the site will also encompass social housing, local community facilities, and an education and early learning facility. While physically situated in Dublin, the National Centre will be accessible to all survivors, whether in other parts of Ireland or abroad, providing digital access to records and exhibits. One unique aspect of the central repository will be the inclusion of personal testimonies of survivors, allowing the lived experience of survivors to be formally accepted as part of the official record. This de development offers the archival profession, and particularly the staff at the National Archives of Ireland, the opportunity, I guess, in a way to demonstrate both the limitations of historic records, but also the potential, their potential in the healing process. While the centre is primarily a long overdue physical and digital recognition of the experience of those who were incar incarcerated, the space will also be a locus for contemporary Irish archivists and archival users and other stakeholders to negotiate the tension between some of the binaries that often inform approaches to their archival landscape of countries. So namely those of evidence and memory, the relationship between the personal and the institutional and the citizen and the state. Engaging with or indeed trying to move beyond many of these binaries have underpinned the way in which Irish archives have developed over the past 100 years and indeed how they will continue to develop into the future, both north and south of the border. Many thanks. Uh, thank you, Liz. That was absolutely.